Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the intro. Um, you know, I want to keep this as interactive as I possibly can, so please stop and ask a question. If there's no questions, I assume you understand it completely and you're all experts at the end of it. And I can give out certificates for everybody. Um, and then you'll get grief for it, right? So I wanted to, I put Art of War here because A, I love uh, the book itself, uh, and B, I think there's an aspect of what we do which can be very similar to this. Um, we present an idea, we pitch, uh, or we design an, uh, a thing for a client, uh, or our internal, our own customers, or BUs, um, and we do it in a manner where we think we're doing the best we can for them, right? Uh, and a lot of times what tends to happen as we look at a migration to cloud, and it's better now than it was two years ago. Uh, two years ago, there was a lot of hype on cloud migration, and it's somehow going to magically fix everything. Um, I've been in this industry 27 years now. Uh, I started building PCs. Um, I've never found a single thing that fixed everything, right? So it still amazes me today that people get caught in the hype of, I'm going to move something, and it's going to magically fix all my problems. Yeah, look, like anything in life, if I fix a performance issue in one area, it typically shows up somewhere else, right? So a good example of that for me was I had a, I spent a lot of money on, by the way, uh, on an original Evo 1, Evolution Mitsubishi. And I thought to myself, how good would it be if I open up the pipes from the manifold through to the exhaust? So I did that, and then I broke my turbo. So I thought, okay, I'll replace the turbo with a very large turbo. You can see where the story's going, right? So I continued the story, and I spent 25 grand replacing every component as it failed, to the point where the car was actually unusable for driving normally, right? Because I had tweaked it so much that it was only good for nine second uh, quarter miles. Uh, and not much else for anything other than that. Um, so the whole point of this is Art of War is, you know, not a uh, perfect guide of how you can run a business or your own lifestyle or your own personality or your own emotions, but it's a very good mechanism, I think, that covers off what we would expect to see uh, when I push something to the cloud and I want it to be elastic, I want it to auto-scale, I want it to self-heal, and I want it to be fast, and I want it to be protected. Uh, a good example of not what to do is census. Sorry, census. Sorry, IBM. Any more IBM guys here? I apologize. I hope you weren't involved. <laughs> because hopefully you weren't involved. Uh, but they're getting out the health, health SAP implementation. Yeah, well, that's another one, right? Let's not go there. So um, I hope it's interactive. I hope it means something to you. Please stop me and call bullshit. I'm happy to fight it with you. I'm a Kiwi, so it's what we do. Uh, but um, the idea is it to be, meaningless, to be meaningful, not meaningless. So, um, who am I? Awesome. <laughs> we'll get there. You're good. So, 27, 27 years, as I said, um, last 16 in networking. Uh, I'm an engineer, but I converted to the dark side about seven, eight years ago. <coughs> I still see myself as a technical salesperson, uh, but um, yes, I'm selling. Welcome to the real world of IT. Uh, and I ride motorbikes, that's pretty much what I do, especially in Australia, I love it. Um, there's a few of them I had, I've had a Busa, uh, I had a Harley, I had an R6, this is not in sequence. <laughs> uh, I had another Harley, uh, and then I had a Duke, uh, and then I had an Indian, and then just for giggles, uh, I'm missing one, but it's okay. Um, I also ended up uh, riding off a, a Troy Bayless sign 1098 on the track. Uh, wasn't my best day, uh, but rather expensive, non-insured version of it. Uh, that was 45k on a good environment, but that's all right. It's part of the fun. It's what you do uh, when you ride when you ride bikes. It's not if, it's when. So you move on. So if I look at what happens with most of my customers when I talk to them, what are three biggest complaints or concerns? The cloud, ignoring the hype, and just based on reality. Those are the three things I get talked about all the time. I don't understand how I'm going to get from on-premise to cloud. Uh, I don't fully understand necessarily what the implications are, what's my connectivity like, what's my back-end systems are like, how do I get security and access to it, do I have to turn on uh, identity management, do I enable my, my uh, distributed uh, uh, AD environment into the cloud and vice versa. There's a bunch of, that's the biggest part of the topic of migration. And then if I just say, you know what, uh, I get all those things, or at least I've addressed them, uh, reviewed them, and try to mitigate them. 
I end up with the last two, which is actually pretty important. The number of customers, and we did a survey late last year, by the way, top 1,000 customers globally, uh, and what we found was pretty amazing. I, I didn't think it was anything unusual, but, but people who commissioned the report thought it was amazing. It was 84% of all people they interviewed or assessed uh, didn't think their website was performing. They didn't believe their web application was good enough. 84%. I already knew the answer. I'd seen the website. How many of you go and try to buy something on the web and after a little while of slowing down and pauses and issues, do you go somewhere else? I do, within probably four or five clicks, right? There's enough demand, there's enough place I can find that sells me the one thing I need in four or five locations, why would I put up with poor performance? The even funny one thing that I do typically, and I'm sure you guys do it as well, is I right click and I look at what is the content for that website and I look at what I can do to play with it. Because, you know, that's the kind of person I am. Uh, I see an item that I want for $1,000, could I put a force brute URL in and ask for it for $1? Oh, it did work. Crap, I better get out. Uh, it's surprising how many websites today, and they don't have to be crucial, right? They don't have to be e-commerce orientated. They can just do, you know, a presentation of information about your company or your customer's company. That's it. And I can still cause a lot of trouble for a lot of people on that basis. And even if you agree, arguably agree with what happened at Census, which I don't, and they had a distributed denial of service on application, which I don't agree with. I don't believe I saw it. I didn't look at the maps for inbound traffic. I did not see the traffic they said they were saying. Even if that was true, wouldn't you design an application that was web orientated? They knew, they told everyone on Tuesday night to log in and update their information. How many people live in Australia? Arguably, if you said half, wouldn't you cater for that? So there is aspects of this migration and they don't take into account the benefits of the environment they migrate to. They take what they have, they uplift their on-premise environment and they shift to the cloud and apply the same strategy they've always done in data center and assume somehow magically the cloud's going to resolve a bunch of issues. We know that's not true. And the first one, by the way, when I started researching uh, this issue and trying to mitigate some of the concerns my customers had, it's a long, long list. And, you know, the reality is this is a big issue for Microsoft because they want the customer to have the best experience. They want them to leverage the technologies in place. The ability, for example, to have VMs on the same environment they, in, in their environment they have and not talk to each other because you've told them to, natively. So why would you go in and bring in multiple DMZs like you have in your data center into Azure Cloud? Well, that makes no sense. You're wasting a bunch of time and effort to put firewalls in place for south, for north south, when the environment itself dictates that behavior anyway. And you're ignoring east west, which everyone does, right? So if I take those three, how do I fix it? How does brocade, which is the pitch, right? Why am I different to every other vendor doing the same argument? It's pretty easy, really. So integration, migration of apps. By the way, the third one is the least focused and developed. And it's the one that kills it every single time. Process and culture. If you don't enable that behavior, if the BUs in the internal customer doesn't believe in what the cloud is delivering, or they have an unrealistic expectation of what's going to happen when you migrate to cloud, that is what fails every single time. I've seen it happen every time I go in and we do this right and this right, and let's say we don't do that that well, but we do okay with it. But the expectation is either unrealistic or just not a reasonable value. So there's one thing I can give away from ex excluding the technology itself. I don't care who you use, but if you follow this, I can almost guarantee it'll work. My analogy here is you can go into a restaurant and you can get really bad service and have great food. And you walk away going, well, you know, wasn't so bad. Right? That's the analogy. If you get one part really well, and that's the bit that, that flows on, trickles on for everything else, then the other stuff you can always fix. Trying to fix this halfway through or after migration, good luck. 
it's throw away, restart. How many of you have been in environments where a new CTO or CIO has come in and they've just thrown away the previous uh, two, three years and done their own version because they did it wrong? Come on, be honest. I agreed. I'm probably being polite. But the reality is, if process and culture is very accurate, then the rest of the stuff can be fixed reasonably easy without throwing everything out, the baby in the bathwater. So it comes to the old, and I know this is a new uh, buzzword, by the way. Everyone loves automation, DevOps, blue-green. Right? But to a certain degree, it's probably more practical. I like to think so, anyway. Less hyped more reasonable, there are some net-net uh, deliverable benefits in automation and DevOps behaviours, right? Does everyone understand what blue-green and the mechanism of it and what, what it actually resolves? So if I take a VM or an environment and I have to update it, the old school way of doing this, I went in, I took a change control and I updated that particular VM or that particular command line or whatever that component part I needed to do, right? And all, how often would that be wrong? or someone mistyped something, or it didn't get tested properly and it caused an outage, right? And you try to fix it. The principle behind blue-green is I never go back to the previous instance of function. I replace it with a new version and I test it in the change window. If it does not work, I revert back to the blue. This mechanism is statistically proven to save 30% of all issues, straight away, without even doing anything else because you're never going back and enabling a behavior that might be a mistake. You're creating new, and you might create a new mistake, but guess what, when it doesn't work, you can drop back out of it and be done in 15 minutes. So sprints are actually good things. I'm sure guys that do sprints today, you know, get a lot of grief for it. By the way, networking and applications are now very, very blurred. We live in a world of layer four to seven. The networking component really I'm not so worried about, to a certain degree, right? Especially cloud. If they can't get that right, they shouldn't be a cloud. So what we look at here is the VADC, and we call it V for virtual, ADC being application delivery controllers, you can call it LBs, whatever you like. But in essence, what we're talking about is a layer four to seven device that will sit in between the requesting traffic from your customers from the browsers hitting the internal uh, websites being or hosted in Azure. And we can help with the migra migration component by being smart about DevOps and automation. We already have an ARM template in place. Uh, Spike will demo very shortly at the end of this how easy it is to spin up a VTM and WAF instance <coughs> in front of your environment uh, and look at automating. Uh, Brocade itself has spent a lot of time and effort uh, putting in place uh, DevOps-based behaviors. We have a DevOps team of 11 people here in Australia. Uh, they're the, fo the foundation of DevOps people in APAC. And we have done a lot of uh, software-defined networking automation for large companies. And all we do is take one particular use case. If you think about yourself internally, what's the most common move, add, and change that you do that's painful? And all we do is come in and look at it, and we look at automating it. A good example is a large telco here in Australia. Uh, their largest, most painful move out and change is a brand new MPLS service. It takes eight weeks, best case, sometimes longer. Uh, and it's a very painful process for them and for the customer. We narrowed that down from an eight week best case scenario to a one hour. So from initial request from customer <coughs> to provisioning, one hour, most of that is, is flow control. So i.e., are you okay with it, are you okay with it, are you okay with it? The actual component configuration is seven minutes end to end. And that's what Brocade deals with. We look at things that we can automate to make simple, and then we apply self-heal and self-enablement behaviors on top of that. So operationally, as it goes forward, we can fix things. So um, we are fully supported in Azure in regards to templating, and ARM, um, we're going to go with the key, cult, the key Azure Key Vault. Uh, we do hour billing and bring your own licenses. Um, and we have VTM, which is your LB based behaviors. Uh, and we have WAF, uh, until recently, a, a decent WAF compared to what everyone else was going on Azure. Uh, I haven't seen the full featured Azure one yet. 
uh, but I'm sure we're complementary. This is what it looks like. You can search on it, deploy it, test it. It spins up as you know uh, one meg license and you can allocate as you need. Uh, you can bring your own version or license to it and apply it. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, that's the template. Uh, we have a slightly more enhanced version than that, uh, which is basically saying nothing, um, which I'm happy to give and let you know what it is and how it works. Um, we even take one step back from that and we're starting to use uh, a Terraform template, which is an abstraction away from, from JSOC, um, which is, can be beneficial because it allows you then to provision and migrate from VMware, for example, on-premise to ARM, uh, and it does both at the same time. So it gives you a bit more flexibility because obviously it can talk to multiple environments and use the same template structure. And that's the whole principle behind automation. Um, we have a thing called Bro uh, Brocade Workflow Composer, uh, or BWC. Uh, BWC, basically, uh, we got with Stackstorm. We bought them about a year ago. Um, Stackstorm's all about the idea of event-driven management. This is the principle behind self-healing. In essence, BWC is the provisioning mechanism. Stackstorm is the operational checking and valuing. So in essence, what it does uh, is it allows you to run sensors, and then rules, and then actions. It's that simple. Good example is I have a sensor that looks for a VM behavior. The VM behavior stops performing like I want it to. Sensor picks it up. It says, what three common rules would a tech two or tech three person do in this scenario? Reboot the VM, reissue the VM. So the, work, the workflow composer will go, okay, I'm gonna re-instantiate the VM. Did it fix the problem? No. Okay, what's my next step? And you can apply as many of those rules as you like. In essence, what it's trying to do is stop the level of requirement where an escalation person has to get involved with minor behaviors. And all they would do is three common behaviors in the first place. Reinstantiate, reboot, reinitialize, right? Simple, simple things that's something that can, that can be smart enough can action. And that's basically the principle behind a self-heal behavior. Uh, my VM is no longer working or my particular microservice is not doing its job properly, recreate it. Did that fix the problem? No. What's the next step? That's BWC. It also allows you to do um, initial provisioning as well. So you can actually spin up a brand new environment on premise and cloud, and then stick the monitor at the same time. Um, and it's at this point at no cost. Right? You can download Stackstorm and BWC uh, and deploy it and work with it and at no cost. Log support case, different issue. And by the way, that, that's the trend that we're going to be seeing in this industry. It, that product is zero cost, but you pay for support and for customized stabilization. Ultimately, you're going to pay somewhere, right? It's just the, the meaning of the world. So that's the architecture. In simple locations, it's workflow behaviors. You have a bunch of UIs, um, and we cover off HTML, REST API, form fill, command line cut and paste, because we have to. There's such a massive install base of uh, old school behaviors that we have to cater for all those things to make one linked uh, workflow work correctly, which is what we did at that large telco. We had to go into command line cut paste on Cisco and REST API calls on brocade switches and a whole bunch of stuff in between. Uh, and then you've got disposable uh, services, um, uh, credit, you know, workflow engines, uh, authorization, data stores, and this is all based on OpenFlow. So again, part of the community, we add to it. There's some driver stuff that you're gonna do down here on tools and systems, but in essence, uh, it's build as you need, as you like. And you can get us involved or not as you like. I'll just skip that because I've talked it through. So um, back in the Sun Tzu, um, speed is one aspect of war. If I'm fast to the battleground, I pick the best spot, uh, I'm typically going to be in a better position to attack my enemy. Uh, and as the application gets migrated from off-prem to cloud, typically what we see is no one thinks about fine-tuning that app. And a good example of that is the fact of autoscale, which I believe is table stakes for any load-balancing device in a cloud. 
Autoscale implies that as we can increase in traffic hitting the front end, we spin up the associated devices or VMs in the back end to meet demand of that flow of traffic, and then decrease as required. If you can't do auto scale, that, is means, that means you're not cloud orientated. If you can't spin up and spin down, because the LB device is the device that understands the termination of SSL, understands the flow of traffic, it gets to understand HTTP and all its behaviors and have its access through the back end. And another good example of that for performance, by the way, is HTTP 2.0 for browsers and 1.1, which is typically your application. There's an immediate uh, performance benefit in being a gateway for those things. If I look at a browser today and I look at 1.1 standard, it is a single session and X amount of objects. If I convert and use HP2.0, it's multiple TCP sessions and multiple objects. And the reality is we're not going away. In fact, we're increasing the amount of objects on our pages. We want to get more rendered, uh, you know, more sensationalist uh, on our websites. So the demand for more throughput is required. And yes, will we have 2.0 applications? Absolutely. But you know how hard it is a lot of times to convert an application for that behavior. And catering for the browser types and variations can be quite painful. So having a device in the middle that terminates the initial connections and is aware of the variation of browser types and automation and, and uh, acceleration behaviors is, you know, beneficial. So we call these things elastic and speed. Elastic, stretch and grow as you need, uh, and speed because we're doing 2.0 and I'm sure a bunch of variations as we release uh, uh, more functional and uh, new versions of RSCs for HTTP. And when I say HTTP, by the way, what I mean is ultimately uh, termination of SSL and then HTTP as, as or HTML as the programmable language that's going from browser to, to, to server. So part of our survey, um, there is an expectation that we see a website that loads in two seconds or less. 47% of us. I, I think that stat's quite low. It's been, <coughs> it's been the accepted uh, time for the last three decades. Right. So the reality is I wanted to pop if it's not popping, then I'm going to lose attention. And I can't see too many millennials in the room, but those guys especially uh, don't like having it wait. Uh, and out of those, 40% abandon more than three seconds delayed. It's a little bit harsh. <laughs> Depends how much I want the product. <laughs> Some of those transaction sites can take. Card, yes. Uh, but we need to manage but, the behavior. Correct. Right? Exactly right. And, and, and set expectation correctly. If, yep. If your first experience with the site is two seconds or less, and you come to it again, it's gone. Yes. If, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If your first experience is three or four seconds, there's tolerations after it, but once it gets under that two second mark, yep. if you go back again, you're yep. And inconsistency, by the way, is the, is the number one bad value that you can have. Two, five. Five, nine, nine, one, right? Because it just puts you in a situation where you, you don't know what's going to happen next. One of the things which we have, we have been noticing is uh, more and more sites want to have personalizations to yes. drive the sale, and I think that's doing more damage to they, they are sales. correct. Not in order to customize the experience, they're killing it actually. Yes. Sorry, we're taking up all the questions. No, no. You guys will get a go later. <laughs> Um, you talked about the HP2 and multiple sessions and so on. Yes. So we, um, we have uh, some load balancing technologies for on-premises and um, we found you know, while you may scale out your front ends on you know, infrastructure as a service, yes. you potentially get uh, socket depletion when uh, you set your browsers. Yeah, you can have 10, 15, 20 sessions. Where you go, oh, let's say, oh, we'll have half a million people now come to our website, yeah. which we do. Yes. Um, and, and, I, and I would argue at that point there is, there is, and that's the old school way of doing stuff by the way, is it, oh, yeah. there, there's a mechanism of auto scale, which I mentioned, right? Elasticity for cloud means that um, if I confine myself to initial config and I run basically two sets of IPs in the front end, then I limit myself to 100, 130,000 potential ports. Yeah. 
Um, instead, if what I do, if I use an elastic set of IPs, and I use DNS to be smart about what they call um, reverse yes, load so balancing, yeah. then I hit myself and say, well, I can spin up as many front IPs as I need to meet demand, and I'll never ever get, I'll say never ever, a very unlikely set of circumstances where I run it out of uh, 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 port space and IP. Because remember, if you've got a smart LB, it's also reaping. Yeah, the other aspect that I uh, haven't seen AWS, which I believe does a bit better, is that... Um, With Elastic the, IP? Yeah, the uh, Zool thing is that it's when you your DNS for your web app may may have multiple IPs behind it, but yes. it's a C name to a C name to yes. a C name. Correct. To a C name which is why you want ADC to take an uh, authoritative answer instead of... Um, yeah. uh, another DNS-based behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're right, AWS does a little bit differently, still has the same set of issues. DNS is a 21-year-old protocol. It was never designed to the degree that we're relying on today, mm -hmm. ever, ever. So there's a bunch of short hole behaviors for DNS. Black holding is a good example of bad DNS, but what can you do? You can try and force a TTL value which is much lower, yeah, right? Yeah. But the browser holds it anyway. So you are structurally in a situation where, is it perfect? No. Are there mechanisms to mitigate? Absolutely. And so if, you're, if I look at what I would do on premise, it is actually quite different to what I do in cloud. On premise, I would do GSLB and I'd be smart and I have multiple listeners and I would try and mitigate the risk. Would I still have it? Absolutely. With cloud, I wouldn't do the same strategy. Oh yeah, I'm not implying, but yeah. Two but, scenarios are the same. Yeah, exactly right. So, so same, same principle mitigation of the risk you're arguing. Um, the cloud variation actually is what I call reverse LB, where I actually poll my devices to listen independent of the location, and then I dictate the same set of C names what the IP changes are. It's a different way of doing it, but mitigates a lot of risk. <coughs> it's just a smarter way, and I'm happy to go in, in depth That's with you. Good. We're doing it for a customer at the moment, and, and I'm an old school GSLB guy. And the guy that brought this to me, I sort of went, no, nah, no, nah, they went, oh, hang on, ooh, okay. It's just a few, th a different way of doing it. Um, yeah, listen, everyone understands this, right? If you're e-commerce, this is a US numbers, I apologize, but you know, that's the right of the slides. Uh, if you had a $100,000 business, the reality is you're gonna be impacted by it. Um, and no one necessarily, unless you've started from ground up in cloud, fully understands the fine tuning required or the degree of benefit you can get. And there's a lot, by the way. By throwing, as, as um, uh, Spike will show you, just throwing a device that's smart enough from the get-go in a base profile, there's an immediate benefit in behavior. Immediate. Um, right, I mean, you know, this is common sense, right? If it's slow, I'm not going to use it. Vance Bourne or Vance and Bourne were the company that we used uh, to do the uh, assessment late last year. I'm happy to share the report. It's about 60 pages long. Uh, in essence, those four or five slides detail exactly what happened. Uh, they, they reviewed it. They asked opinions of people. And as we know, opinions uh, are perception, and perception is the rule. I'm not saying it's true or not, but they, their belief was their websites could not scale to the degree they thought they could, nor were they performing as much as they thought they were. It's that simple. And perception is what dictates uh, what happens next. I just want to also, I'm going back to that one second one. I see a lot of architectural decisions which are done at very oh. different layers. But the actual programmer or actual coder which is doing it, if he does stuff up, yes, and no matter you have very fancy infrastructure yep. in the cloud, yes, but yeah. there's no way you can achieve that kind of performance. Disagree. Happy to explain it later on. The trend we're going down is microservices. If I have a microservice, I know I know it's a buzzword again, but if I have a microservice solution and I've split out my entire chain of function from from client initial connection from back-end service, then I can automate and self-heal on that behavior. I can monitor or censor a part of my infrastructure that's misbehaving and say, that's not normal. Let me restart or re-instantiate that part of the microservice. Oh, that fixed the problem. So to a certain degree, I can argue I could. You're still limited by the technology that we have in place today. 
and the databases and the flow of traffic and the virtual switching. And there are some things, yes, a, a workflow instantiation cannot fix. But I can guarantee it's a far better situation than you have today. So I agree in principle, but I think we can fix it. I, I think um, what I was trying to say is the average coder or programmer working on a component of the Absolutely. Page, you right. may not have that kind no. of stack experience no. with the performance. And, and there's, very, there's very few people that do. There's very few people that do, which is a shame. Um, because if I look at what I've been dealing, dealing with the last 16 years in, in load balancing in particular, I had two camps constantly fighting each other. Networking, who did the implementation and, did, and understood the vast majority of the layer four behaviors. And I had, the, I had the application guys who wanted the device in the first place. And the two would never talk nicely to each other. Because they're in two different streams. And, and the good news is the last two years, I'm now talking to people that are network dev people and dev people are networking people. So I'm starting to see that blur a lot nicely now than I ever had before. And that's the good news. So if you did these things, if you just did the basics, if you implemented a device that just did the base profile for acceleration, HTTP 2.0 to 1.1, uh, the SSL, SSL 3 termination and function and feature, uh, did the things that require some availability behaviors, then what we're arguing is you would see these values. Uh, and I'm happy to Pepsi challenge you on it. If we can't show this, then don't buy it. Seems quite straightforward to me. Go buy someone else's that can. So, Brocade have a function that we bought them off, river, off Riverbed a year and a bit ago. They bought off a company called Zeus. It was called Steel App. It was a cloud oriented product. It came from Amazon and Google. They used it exclusively themselves internally to certainly we both still do, but they call it by different names. Uh, but in essence, it, was never it never came from a layer four up. It came from layer seven down to fix problems for applications. So it already does the table stakes. It automatically does auto scale. It does self heal. It does full restful API. All of these things you expect an ADC to do today, we've done. Five years ago, they were way too advanced for themselves. They only sold virtual. You could not buy it as an appliance. It only did certain behaviors. For example, it wouldn't do forward proxy very well. So if you had a bunch of enterprise-based applications, it didn't work very well. For the first time in a while, we're in a situation where we did containerization four years ago, prior to Docker. You could run it in a microservice behavior because it's a very low footprint. All these things now make it a lot more sense for me to reboot this product into the market because it now suits the styles that we're seeing from customers. So in essence, when we argue we're saying fast delivery, we're more secure and we're super scalable, it's because we actually are supported on every single cloud platform that exists today, even Oracle. So if you want to install our product on an Oracle platform, we're already supported because we came from that part of the business. The theory is, is that ADC features today are commoditized. If you're paying a premium for your on-premise load balancing, and I won't name the names, I used to work for them, you're paying a lot of money for what was top right-hand quadrant technology three years ago. ADC is now commoditized. It means that you are expected to see less payment for the same service and easier to use. And that is our argument. And that's why we get those stats. Because ultimately, we are as good as anyone else. Feature for feature argument of ADC has gone out the window. There's no feature of ADC today that is any different than any other feature from any other ADC provider today. They're all the same. So what differentiates us from the rest of the market comes down to flexible licensing and ease of use, i.e. cost savings and how easy it to deploy and manage. It's that simple. So if I look at that, and I'll, the, web, the WAF stuff, um, Spike will run through as a demo. 
Uh, if you look what uh, uh, Microsoft released today, uh, we've been doing it for three or four years. There's a huge demand for it. Um, we are uh, in-depth behaviors. We uniquely are different in the market because we allow you to apply a positive security model in listing mode as well as in blocking mode. In essence, you get to run a negative enforcement value that says, I now know my application as of what I think of today in blocking mode and then run a second policy that says, I still want to learn about the behaviors going forward. That's the uniqueness of what we do with our, with our WAF. That's it. Because again, WAFs are feature for feature, the same mostly with every other player in the market. So it's about ease of use and how cost effective is it. It's that simple. ADC, anyone tells you differently for ADC? Send them my way, I'll explain it to them. Even if they are a competitor. <coughs> um, in essence, a WAF uh, is an application firewall. Uh, we're talking about layer four to seven up. We're not talking about layer, uh, layer four down, although it can do some of that. Uh, in essence, what we're focusing on is the aspects of HTTP only. Uh, and we are pulling apart the HTTP payload and we are applying a negative or antivirus set of behaviors to the traffic and saying, does it match a signature? If it does, deny. Uh, the positive model was all about uh, approving uh, an application flow from client through to server and response and saying, these behavior changes are acceptable, the rest are not. By the way, that's the only way you'll get to a zero uh, day exploit protection. If you apply a positive security model, that is your only chance of not being susceptible to someone finding something different on an angel because it will be seen as bad behavior. And the number one failure of WAFs is a positive security model because it's freaking hard to do. And you have to maintain it. You have to deploy it with your dev guys. They have to go through UAT, test and dev and production. You cannot do a positive security model and then throw a new version of the application in front of it and expect it to understand it. And that was the number one failure for WAFs in the last five years. Most of my customers that deploy WAFs either turned them off or put them in learning mode and left them in learning mode. Because they made one change after the initial deployment, brought a new application version on and it broke. So again, process and policy dictates what happens to technology. And security is probably even more arguably crucial than this, than the development process for, for applications. I mean, we've all seen the press releases, right? The amount of hacks recently, denial of services, arguably if you say since it's had or not, I think they did, but you know, whatever. Um, I'm going to skip that past, but here's just a little snapshot I took. There's a website that shows you the last uh, bunch of potential, well, bunch of hacks that have happened in the last 10 years. Um, the large ones, by the way, are the amount of potential leaks that happened. Um, eBay comes to mind. Um, you know, Ubisoft. Uh, you know, anyway. Census isn't there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Yahoo's not there. Uh, that's, this was a presentation a couple, couple months old. But, you know, like riding a motorbike, it's not um, if you'll get hacked, it's when. Ultimately, if someone is that determined to do it, they're probably likely to do it. But your mechanism to know about it and alert on it and mediate is crucial. And that's enough scaremongering. Um, in essence, what we're arguing here is compliance which is about reporting and control. Uh, it's about revenue and reputation. Um, you know, a, a good example is uh, my uh, country's airline. Um, they hacked some of the, the um, login um, things in, in the airport and porn started appearing on the front of them. It did not go well for you in New Zealand. You know, it wasn't a great PR exercise. Did it cost them money per se? I don't know, but it cost them brand. No one likes that, right? Um, I don't know if you guys saw, there was, was a Facebook post, someone hacked the Samsung um, uh, fridges in a shop and put on RedTube across every Samsung fridge that had the web um, uh, LCD on the thing. I, I mean, does that cost lots of revenue? No, but that doesn't look great in the press, does it? 
uh, and best practice, right? And this is where I think we lose a lot of the functionality for security. We focus uh, on these aspects from a technology perspective and we ignore best practice from a user uh, and process perspective. A lot of times we can fix other stuff by process, not about technology. But we use technology to, to, to resolve it. Um, I've got a couple of references. Um, Guilt Group, um, you know, in essence, basically, they have a certain uh, profile of traffic when it hits Azure, uh, and the profile of traffic is extreme. And they had to cater for a scenario where they would normally have perhaps a flow of maybe a gig worth of traffic hitting the website. At peak flow, it went to 25 gig. So they had to behave in a manner that allowed them to do that, but not so much so they had to build it themselves, which is why they went to Azure. Right? If they built that themselves, the worst case scenario, the cost value was much, much higher. This way, uh, they can factor for this auto scale behavior and then decrease when the peak flow finishes. Um, and then Mesa's demand, in essence, these guys went down a path they looked at a traditional methodology of licensing, and by the way, ADC licensing typically is a HA pair of fixed license values. So you might buy two one gig licenses, or two five gig licenses, and you basically put a wet finger in the air and say, I think I'm going to see this much traffic. Let me triple it, and I'm safe. And then a month later, you review it, and you're doing 104 megasecond. That's the old way of doing it. These guys instead, applied our policy of bucket-based license that says, you know what, I'm going to slice the bucket to suit the nature of traffic. I'm going to watermark that traffic at 80%, and at 80%, it's going to trigger a process that says, hey, I need to borrow a license from somewhere. And so you might have, for example, one of 10 VTMs with a spread of five across them, and it might go VTM 9 and 10 aren't being utilized at the moment, very low. I'm going to borrow their license value and redeploy it against the ones that are heavy. And, and that happens automatically as part of their automation process. My largest customer in the world, and I can't name them, but I'm sure you'll figure it out, is they deliver uh, streaming TV and movies. And they have a single license bucket which they shift around the world to suit that flow of traffic. There's a three month ROI for that license because traditionally they would have had to have bought fixed licenses in every pot. Instead, they have a global license that shifts to suit the nature of traffic. So when one half the world is not watching TV and movies, the other half the world gets a license, and that shifts. And that's the, the nature of where I want my customers to be. I want to be in a utility-based pricing model. Right? My boys. Same argument. So, ultimately, if I bring it back to Sun Tzu, uh, the nature of a speed of competition, the protection of, the, of your customers' websites, your own websites, your own online presence, the mitigation of migration to Azure means that you have that ability. You can accelerate it, you can mitigate the risk of older applications that you wouldn't normally migrate to a cloud environment because of a bunch of reasons and it will take you nine months of dev work to fix. Put a device that band-aids it in the short term and allows you the time to re, uh, rethink, redeploy, rebehave as part of DevOps and, and blue-green behaviors. I've talked a lot. I'm good at it. I like hearing my own voice. Somehow that reinforces my behavior. It's worked so far in my life. My wife would uh, say otherwise. So are there any questions? Well, I talk bullshit, because I'm a sales guy, right, now. So I'm allowed to talk bullshit. Sir. So you spoke a little bit about, yes, so you've got six thick, sick so, uh, application, blah, 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 you can automate spinning up and stuff. Yes. The dilemmas we've had with, again, on-premises orientated with uh, low balancing WAF type application, uh, yes. WAF type appliances and so on, is, okay, that can take care of the back end, but there's a lot of little fixes coming through and outages to say this thing that's looking after our entire infrastructure. Right. We're going to do an engineering fix. Oh, yep. there's a version upgrade. Oh, Correct. Oh, we want that to happen and so on. So what's your cadence? Uh, what's typical of the 
Turn around, or what's your approach? You spin up another VM with the new version? Yeah, let, let me grab my wallet and pay you some money. Um, great question. Um, that's, that's DevOps behavior, right? So DevOps behavior says, um, rather than doing monolithic behaviors, one large set of boxes, or um, I'm gonna amalgamate all my applications through this set of boxes because I paid a lot of money for it. Um, instead, let's be smart about the idea of saying, well, why don't I break these things out? Then potentially, rather than having to do one large major outage and then not knowing how well the engineering fix was gonna work, I can split out feature and function of suit. Now, what I'm not saying is, um, what's the extreme end of this, which is I'm gonna spin up a micro ADC and a micro web server and a micro SQL and a micro whatever, right? And have now 100,000 micro applications. What I'm saying is be smart about how you group them together and then um, allocate the function and feature you require in front of it. Now you didn't do that before because of a bunch of reasons. Cost, management, uh, operation, it's painful. And that was all true two, three years ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, that monolith is true in the sense where we're peti uh, petitioning guests within the, the sure. team, team now. But probably the bit that's got me is that, you know, okay, we've looked at this version and the cryptographic algorithms that they understand with the server 2012 behind the scene right. doesn't quite line up. Doesn't so line up. Not, there's a rule we have to put in place right. to get by and then we have to do something. So what I'm probably looking at is more the case of uh, well, yes, that monolith, but, but what's the cadence, typical cadence of changes that you have with regards to what what your appliance, being virtual is there and being flexible, but yeah. what, what sort of things, do you know, and, you know? Well, we typically release a function, an engineering fix every month, um, mm -hmm. and it might vary, it might be a private fix, it might be a public fix. Um, the reality is we're not so concerned by those things because, um, again, what used to be behaviors from our customers two years ago was vastly different today. Uh, and what we're seeing is the acceptance that um, someone can instantiate a brand new instance and running a brand new version of code and actually slice traffic off the production during the day and they're comfortable doing that. Because they know that, that out of the 10 things that might go wrong, eight of those are known quantities. Banks have still some trouble, I think. I, I think, but they are, yeah, but they are changing, yeah, right? Yeah. So some, some of the largest banks that we have are now understand this behavior because the side effect of being smart about DevOps and automation and, and self-healing and autoscale and all these things that you know we've always wanted to do but couldn't, that they have a material effect. You can see it. I'm not selling a, a you know, you're not seeing a, 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 a smoke dream or a pipe dream or there's no weird sort of soft value here. If I do automation, I get this benefit. If I do self-healing, I get this benefit. If I never go back to the original instance of the engineering version, then I don't have the problem where someone makes a mistake. It's always a brand new instance that I'm verifying. And if you go through the process and do a sprint across UAT, test, dev, and production, the likelihood of you hitting a problem when you hit production is very, very low. And if it is, great, just revert back to the old one. It's not, it's not hard. Uh, and it, the sprint dies and you recreate. And you might do potentially 10 of those in a month. Right? Um, so I've got some customers that are releasing, in essence, a new rev version to their code. Have you guys caught a, uh, heard of Acorns? They're a fintech company. Um, in essence, what you do is, what you used to do is you throw coins after buying coffee into a jar. Um, what you do is you tap your car to buy coffee. It rounds up and then invests the money for you in the share, in the share market. Now that's 100% online, uh, and they release a rev version for that backend system every three days. You could not do that in using the old school methodology. You couldn't do it. And I don't know about you, but I use Acorn uh, exclusively. Like that's my favourite thing to do. I look at my number. I look at my things every day. I look and go, "Ooh, I made $17," you know, overnight. If that stops working, or is slow then that's gonna make me very nervous because it has access to two of my bank accounts. So they know that they live and die by performance and security, right? And that's a shift in behavior. There's a bunch of these new FinTech companies popping up all around the place, right? But good question. That's the big issue with migration. Anyone else? You're all experts now and give you certifications when you leave the door? Okay. Well, I might hand over a spite demo. I've talked enough. 
I have some other slides. Um, it, hopefully everyone's filled out. If you haven't, please fill it out. I'll give the drone away and a Spike's demo. Um, and I'm sorry I'll keep you guys late. Spike, you have to condense your whole demo in three and a half minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, try to do it in one minute. Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you.